Hey everybody, welcome back to one of my favorite series to do here at This Week in Startups. We call it our Startup Legal Basics Series. We do it with what's considered the top firm, one of the top firms uh, in technology and startups and capital allocation, Wilson Sonsini. Now, Wilson Sonsini's got a lot of talent. So he's got a deep bench. I work with them. They're uh, my attorneys. And we had a very niche discussion we wanted to have for this year's Startup Basics around AI. And so when I was talking to Becky DeGraw, who usually does this series with me, and you can see the archive at thisweekinstartups.com slash basics, uh, she said, you know, I got an expert for this topic. L can I bring in, uh, go deep on the bench? And uh, Adam Chevelle is a partner at Wilson Sassini. He works on IP. What's IP? That's intellectual property. And AI is coming up big time. You've heard me talk about this both on the All In Podcast and This Week in Startups of, hey, what should the framework be if i'm training an ai model on somebody else's data set this is an emerging topic welcome to the program adam chevelle thanks for having me it's really great to be here all right so i got a lot of startups they're looking at data and they're saying i got a great idea look there's all this disney uh ip in the world mm -hmm. can i take all the marvel scripts and comic books i find and then make a new character out of them hey i would like to uh do something in recipes can i go to Condé Nast website or some recipe database or uh some famous chef mark Straussman's incredible recipes from marks off madsen in new york can i go take his lasagna and um use it to iterate on lasagna recipes what's the answer here yeah well, and i know it's a moving target payment. I'd, I'd be all over Mark Bittman's uh, recipes, but yeah, no, it's a great question, right? Um, you know, getting data, access to data is like the lifeblood of anyone who's building a model, right? You, mm. you need that huge pool of data to make it execute really effectively and do that magic that we see when we go onto the tools that we have access to, right? And there are different places you can get them, right? Like uh, universities have databases that they've compiled over the years. Um, the challenge with those is typically they're, they're non-commercial. So if you want to make a product that you're going to sell eventually, you can't really use those, right? It's against the mm. other rules. Um, open source software, right? GitHub repositories. There's tons of data there. It's available. And then obviously the internet itself, massive treasure trove of data. But the challenge is if you go out there and scrape data, um, there are a bunch of legal risks you're taking, right? Mm. And so you really should go in with your eyes open so you understand, hey, um, here are the risks we're running. There might be ways we can mitigate these risks, but uh, it's not a, a, a risk-free opportunity, right? Um, mm. The biggest one is copyright infringement. And so you mentioned Disney, Marvel. Obviously, they have fabulous uh, IP assets that they've built over decades. Um, they won't take it lightly if you go in there and grab they their stuff. Not. You know they don't. Like, you know, they, they, they are uh, aggressive and, and rightfully so because they have a really valuable uh, asset to protect, right? So. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, and they have spent billions of dollars acquiring yes. some of those Marvel, totally. Star Wars, uh, totally. and Pixar were multi billion dollar acquisitions that then had multiple billions of dollars put into them. And my understanding is, uh, these are all protected IP, there yeah. is a concept and, and, and Disney has actually just to, to pick them specifically, they have worked really hard with IP law here in the United States, mm -hmm. to protect those characters. And I think some of them, like the original Mickey Mouses, there's this concept in IP law of like 75 years since the creator or something. And I'm not up on that exactly right yeah. now. Right. But if you're taking data off the internet, by definition, it's under 30 years old. So it's going to be protected unless somebody explicitly didn't protect it. Am I generally correct in my framing here? Absolutely. So um, for the purposes of, of what we find on the internet, almost all of it is copyright protected. Now, there are artists, let's think, think of like Vincent van Gogh or Mozart, who lived a long time ago. Their copyright protection is, is gone, and so their work is in the public domain. But stuff like Disney, like that's still copyright protected. And mm. copyright law gives the owner some exclusive rights, right? No one else can reproduce that IP, that work of authorship. No one else can prepare derivative works of that authorship, distribute them publicly before them. So basically, it gives them an, a, a monopoly over using that that art and that that all that all, that uh, work of authorship right um so if you're scraping let's just use disney's art or, or or data as an example if you are scraping their site and pulling their art down you know you're reproducing 
right? Which is a violation of copyright in order to train your model, right? And actually mm. there's, there's a lawsuit currently, Getty is suing Stability AI. And, and the, the argument there is when Stability AI scraped Getty's website, they um, reproduced without like authorization and they violated mm -hmm. Getty's copyright. So that's, that's the argument they're making. It's, it remains and to be seen how that goes. Yeah, the, the fact is when, you, and the examples given in that suit uh, and that claim literally showed the watermark from Getty. <laughs> So it did. It did. This was, I would say, not a very thoughtful execution on the part of stable diffusion. And the best practice always in law, because I'm a content producer for many years as a journalist, is when in doubt, get permission. Now, there is a concept of fair use. That's right. I have had long, I have a long history with this, um, just as a content creator again. Mm -hmm. um, if people want, to understand fair use, they need to understand this is a multi part test here in the United States. Again, you can correct me where I'm wrong, but I try to explain this to my founders. This is a multi part test that is subject to the interpretation of the courts, it very rarely gets to a decision. Because people tend to have a lawsuit or legal letters or a debate over do they feel that you're being fair? in your interpretation of fair use. So let's give a little primer to people listening of the multiple part tests of fair use and, and where it's obviously applicable, or where people maybe are selectively interpreting fair use incorrectly. Sure. So um, the, the biggest challenge with fair use is that you don't know what fair use is until a court tells you what it is. Each yes. time is different, right? You, there's no uh, there, there are, there's a test and then we can go through the tests and tell you what different parts are. But ultimately, if, uh, the case of stable diffusion is or is not fair use is going to be cited by one judge, maybe mm. it gets appealed, but, but essentially the court's going to decide. And if there's another case that Getty sues, let's say a different company in a different case, that, that would be a different, a test. And, and we'd re reapply the same legal test to the different facts, right? So it's factually mm. dependent. Um, the four main factors for fair use that the courts uh, weigh are the purpose and character of the use, right? This one gets a lot of attention, right? Is the new use um, new in some way? Are you adding a new transformative nature to that work of art or work of authorship, right? Now, the second is the nature of the copyrighted work. A technical manual for your dishwasher gets less protection than, let's say, a novel by Dickens, mm. right? Like, so the, the, the artistic merit of, of the actual work uh, weighs in, um, the amount of, and substantiality of, of substantiality of the portion you you've copied is also important. If you took mm. a small snippet, as opposed to the entire work that will weigh differently. Is that fair? Are you taking a very small piece or are you just kind of taking the whole thing and, and copying the work and doing something with it? Mm. Lastly, and this, yeah, it, it was very interesting because, you know, I am obsessed with fair use uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> as a content creator. I remember there was like a famous documentary and it was at Sundance and it, they were talking about, you know, the rating system and mm -hmm. they came out. I remember talking to some attorneys, it, it will come to be the name of the film, but it's not important. They wanted to use certain scenes um, to explain this point. And they up front, because usually when you do apply for distribution for a film, they want to see that every single clip has been cleared. They mm -hmm. said, nope, this is a documentary. It is fair use. We're using it. And I'm jumping the gun here a little bit sure. for educational purposes, etc. We're using a tiny portion of these original films. Mm -hmm. And we will not um, get permission in advance. And they did not get stopped. Because again, with fair use, you have to have somebody on the other side, as you very clearly said, a judge has to decide it's open for interpretation. The other person has to feel it's worth going to bat to protect yes. their IP. And yes. if a documentary film wants to use five seconds or 10 seconds to make a point that's educational, and it's obviously, uh, you know, in context, uh, you know, the, the, the other copyright holder might not even feel this is an existential threat to them in any way, and they don't take action. So yeah, well, actually, that's, that's, just, that's a great like, story. That's the pragmatic part of it. So go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I know it leads into the, the fourth factor, which is the effect on the copyrighted works market, right? If you're mm. taking the original work, making a, a different version of it and selling into the same market, you know, that first owner is going to lose market share, right? Mm. You're a competitor. So if you're competing with the original owner, that's mm. also going to weigh against fair use. If you're mm. taking it and putting it to a completely different use and it's transformational, then 
that's more likely going to be determined as fair use. But again, each time is fact specific, right? Yeah. And what's interesting is, you know, you talked about the parties really having the desire and resources to go all the way and fight the fight for fair use. You know, yeah. a really a high high uh, profile case was the Oracle v. Google case, right? Mm. With the, the Java um, APIs. And, and Oracle sued Google in 2011, okay, or 2010. And it took almost 11 years Wild. to get to the Supreme Court ruling where the Supreme Court ruled that Google's use of the APIs in this instance didn't say all use of, of copying API you know, uh, command lines are, are fair use. But in this instance, it was fair use. It took 11 years. And you had two companies wow. with uh, some of the the biggest resources, biggest pockets in, in, in on the whole world. Yeah. To fight I think we know, who won, that case. <laughs> yeah, we, we know who yeah, won that case. We know who won. The attorneys won that case. Yeah. <laughs> the, the attorneys did fine, I'm sure. However, yeah. the, yeah. you know, but, but if you think about it, 11 years, okay, wow. from start to finish, how does that match up with the pace and rate of change in generative mm-hmm. AI? Yeah. It's so... It's so mismatched. Like, it, how, how can the court systems be relevant with mm. the rate of change that's happening in, in yeah. the AI industry? It's, 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 it's going to be really interesting to see because a lot of these questions, like when I advise my startups that my clients, like, hey, can we do this? The answer is always like, I, I, I don't know yet. We're going to find yes. out. Here, here is, are the factors that are going into it. Yeah, see, this is the frustrating part for, I think, a lot of young individuals starting companies who haven't had to deal with this issue. and. An attorney cannot tell you, here's the bright line, and here's where you're good, and then here's where you stepped over the line. Mm -hmm. And what you have to then take into account is the totality of the situation. And a framing I use, and I'm curious uh, what you think of this is, it relates to that fourth part of the test, which is, hey, is this going to affect the original copyright holder's ability, essentially, to uh, monetize, to to exploit their, their creation in the future? Now, if you look at what Stable Diffusion did, this will be my opinion. Uh, I don't speak for you or Wilson Sonsini, but my opinion is it's obviously uh, going to affect it because Getty could create their own Stable Diffusion, which is, by the way, based on an open source project. They could create their own product that builds off of that. And the uh, IP holders of those original photos, if they are in a revenue sharing deal, would be able to monetize that. So, of course... They're infringing on it. But a more simple step to take is how fair does the person on the other side of your innovation feel about it? And when you look at Google, their use of content uh, with snippets, you know, they're only using a snippet of your website's information that felt fair to people. And there was traffic being sent to you. Therefore, you very rarely saw anybody saber rattle or threaten to sue Google for putting a little snippet because there was a blue link directly to your website and it essentially was like a little amuse bouge that you know first 500 characters and by the way you could opt out of it too you can do robots.txt which mm-hmm. facebook did which craigslist does so th- let's talk about the fair and fair use and and how founders that you you work with you could kind of walk them through how to think about this and avoid problems in the future yeah sure so you know a- as you allude to the test is technical and almost mm. no one ever finds out if it actually is or is not fair use, right? Mm. You, may, you make a pragmatic decision balancing all the risks. And what you uh, mentioned, it, how, how impactful is this going to be on the company or the individuals that we are um, reusing their uh, original material? Are they going to be impacted negatively? Are they going to dislike that we're in the market doing what we're doing? Or actually, they mm. might like that we're channel for them in the case of Google and the snippets, right? Um, so that's a real uh, sniff test as far as are we going to come down uh, the line and in a couple of years have people throwing claims at us or not, right? Mm. And th- the the more competitive your use is with the original uh, data owners uh, market, uh, and the more competitive you are with them, like I mean, it's it's just common sense. You're you're, you're running a higher risk of of running into issues. And the other thing is it, it's important to have a coherent strategy, whatever you do right? Mm. Like there are lots of different ways to get there, but being able to articulate what the risks are, how you balance them and why this balance and approach is right for your company is not only good for the company, but when you get into term sheet land and you have a venture firm coming to invest in your company, they're going to want to hear this strategy, right? They're not, they're not dumb. They have lawyers who are looking at this very intently. And so being able to articulate why you're taking this balanced approach to this risk 
is going to be really important for your company's success if you're if you're looking for venture investment. What are the the major cases right now? I know there's a GitHub. Yeah. Ver- so open source folks are suing GitHub for their copilot. Explain that one maybe in yeah. broad strokes. Okay, so this is re- this is really interesting, right? Because it has to do with open source software. And for those who know open source software, um, it it basically it's it's software that the owner has made available to the public um, to use, right? So on its face, you think, okay, well, here's some source code. Um, so and so wrote it, and they've released it to the public, right? Mm. Um, so the the arguments in this case, where you have some uh, software developers suing GitHub, I think OpenAI and Microsoft is in there too, because Microsoft now owns GitHub. Um, they're arguing that even though the open source software is made available and anyone could grab it, download it, fork it, develop it, whatever they want, um, there are still license terms that apply, right? Mm. And even the most permissive license terms um, have some requirements that weren't being followed by mm. co-pilots and, and the developers. And the argument is, they allege that um, there is both a, a duty to notify future users that mm. part of the software was copyright so-and-so, whoever, whoever wrote it, right? And so by ingesting all the software, and then um, producing new software that could match, you know, word for word, li- line for line, the old software, um, they weren't providing that copyright attribution notice that they're required mm. to. And so there's a breach of contract, right? Yes. You had a license with me. I gave you a license to use my code. And one of the, like, one of the few requirements was just tell people when you distribute it. Attribution. That I wrote it. Yeah. It's so giving that's, credit. That's the, it's a yes. core tenet of open source. If you right. want to use this, you just got to, and I think they even say in their license, link back and give credit. And there's Creative Commons and open source, and there's a very granular thing. This would be de minimis for Microsoft to actually put links. In fact, I was so vocal about this with OpenAI that I noticed with OpenAI's web crawler with Bing, they now will from time to time put a citation in. And I was using Bard the other day. They now have images and thumbnails in there, and mm-hmm. they give credit to Yelp, and they linked to Yelp. Interesting. Again, back Interesting. to the fair in fair use. Yeah, it's nonsense that these AI models cannot point to where they got the information from. If properly constructed, you could say some of this information came from here, some of it came from there. Um, it's kind of nonsense to say you can't give a link, and so I think this one will be solved with the links and credit being given to folks and also sure. permission. Let's talk about permission. Mm-hmm. The gold standard is to get written permission from people in advance of doing stuff. Nobody in technology likes to do that. They like to no. beg for forgiveness. So what, what is a proper strategy for folks? Is it to beg for forgiveness? Is it to, um, you know, ask for permission to, to not kick the hornet's nest as it were, and just, put out a little experiment without monetization and see how the market responds to it. What's the pragma, what's the pragmatist approach to this? Yeah, sure. So, I, you know, it, it really depends on the data source. Mm-hmm. Like there are certain data sources that are, are known to be challenging. Like for instance, Craigslist, you, you cannot yes. take Craigslist's data. They will fight you tooth and nail. It's a matter of philosophy and principle for them. And so in that case, uh, ask permission or don't do it because they will, they will hunt you down. If, if, mm. if you take it without permission and, and they will, they will get you as best they can. Right. So um, understand whose data you're using. Craigslist yes. does not stop. Right. They've been very clear from the beginning. Yes. Yeah. And then you also, you're seeing a shift in the market from, you know, companies with huge pools of very valuable data. Like look what happened with Reddit, right? Yes. Um, they went from Let's a, a free up, model yeah. to a, a pay to use model from their perspective. That makes a lot of sense because, Hey, our, our data is now so much more valuable with the, with the, um, huge rush to make these models that like we're a for-profit company we need to make some money and, and here's uh, an asset we could leverage right so you also have to know like how, how is the market moving right and so there they, they want to give permission they want to they want they want you to pay for it right um, mm. rather than coming and taking it without their um, understanding and so mm. um, going back to your initial question though um you know, as long as what you're doing is sort of measured in steps, like the, the challenge is if you do a test and maybe you don't ask permission and maybe mm. you take some data, you run the model, you see how it works. You're like, hey, this is great. Let's keep doing it. If you get to a point down the road where someone sends a cease and desist letter, um, you don't want to be at a point with your product development where mm. you can't put the genie back in the, in, in the lantern, right? You want to be able to stage how you're using the data in a way so that if you do run into a claim down the road, you can kind of I'll say hide your tracks a little bit if you can, mm. right? 
and and yeah. sort of um, be able to um, take away maybe the data that they're complaining about from your product without completely ruining how it works, right? And so just just thinking about contingencies, really, um, you know, yeah. I wouldn't necessarily go out and ask permission each and every time, even though that would be the the legally correct thing. I think pragmatically for startups who are resource strapped and have to be a little bit scrappy, sometimes you need to take a little more risk. And I, all yeah. all I say is just take that risk very calculatedly. Be thoughtful. I, you know, this is, I think, great advice. Um, I can give really granular examples here. People want to do all kinds of thing with the uh, things with the archive of this week in startups and uh, all in. And uh, one of those things a couple of years ago was, hey, I want to make clips on TikTok. And we had a couple of people who wanted to do clip shows. And I said, yeah, uh, I tell you what, mm -hmm. and they contacted me. Is it okay? I said, yeah, um, if you're a fan of the show, and you want to do a couple of clips, you know, go for it. Uh, just always link back to the original episode and just say that, you know, you're not the copyright holder, the copyright yeah. holder is whoever. And, uh, you know, let's check back in a year or two and see what where it's at. Now, some of these things have become big, but and they're not monetizing. So I'm like, okay, fine. If And then in some cases, if they want to monetize, I might be like, well, what is it making? Just keep me informed. If you're making $10,000 a year or less, and you're putting hundreds of hours into this, I, I guess I'm okay with it. You know, it's, it's promoting the show. But then I had this one group that was taking the entire episodes um, and then using AI to put them into sections, clipping them, and then putting ads oh. around them. And I said, yeah. no bueno, uh, this is not fair. And, uh, and they were doing it with Tim Ferriss and some other folks. And I just told Tim and other folks like, hey, do you know this is happening? And they were like, this is BS. And I said to the person, listen, if you want to not put ads on it, and you're using the original mp3 file i'm okay with it and you give credit and you link back to the original show in the interface and their interface was always like this week in startups next episode or this week in startup you know uh, and no links back to us or they would make a tiny little link and this is where i think you know if you wanted to do an experiment okay do it but think about the person who put the effort into that content and how you could be fair with them link backs credit Using the original MP3 yeah. file, it's a very subtle point here, but we get the data on that person listening to it. If you rip the file and put it on your server, I don't know how yeah. many views you're getting. My advertisers don't know. I don't. I can't cookie the person if they mm -hmm. have cookies turned on. So I like your strategy here. You can take a little risk. You can do a little experiment. I think turning off monetization on these things is also critical and framing yeah. them as an experiment and taking feedback in good faith, um, super important. All right, listen, this is incredible. Get a good lawyer if you're doing this. Uh, <laughs> because it's going to lead to a lot of discussions, man, I just sent you a link in the in the chat. Craigslist has gotten judgments against yeah. people. I was reading this headline here, Craigslist garnered $60 million judgment against rad pad in scraping dispute. I think just be careful if you're doing mm -hmm. this kind of stuff that this could be the end of your startup. Um, pragmatically, you raise a half million dollars or a million dollars. And you're coming out of tech stars or Y Combinator or launch accelerator, and you get hit with one of these. That's it. Game over for your firm. You're, you 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 have seen this happen. Startups get crushed with the legal oh, yeah. bill freezes future funding. So this could be existential and be the end of the line for your startup. Yeah, absolutely. Adam, I was super fascinated by this one. I could talk to you all day. This is supposed to be like mm -hmm. a short segment, but I got to bring <laughs> it up. Andy Warhol lost in the Supreme Court is uh yeah. tomato cans or whatever it was that were based on photos uh i can't remember which one it was that they actually yeah took it to was the a, mat. yeah it was not transformed it was it was a yeah it was, it was a photograph of prince right mm. and and in the 80s andy warhol had made a painting a, a, a silk screen or some 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 form of, of reproduction Art. uh based yeah. on this photog photograph right mm. and what happened was his estate sold that licensed that photo to a magazine mm -hmm. as part of a, 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 an article about prints and the uh, original photographer suit, right? And what was interesting here is the court really focused on the fourth factor, which is the impact on the market, right? Mm. They basically said this licensing of the Warhol for use by journal, like, a, like in, a, in a photo journal in, in a magazine is directly competitive with the yeah. intent and use of the original photograph, right? Absolutely. She took a photo for uh, a magazine. And so, uh, right, direct comp competition, right? And, mm. and really took away the focus from the first factor, which is whether this use is transformative or not. Mm. And so, if I read between the lines, I think this makes it a harder climb 
for companies who are scraping and training models on internet data yep. to reuse fair use because they're real the real crux of that argument is this is transformative right mm. there, there might be an image or or data or there might be a conversation but like what we're doing is like changing all of that into this really complex computer system this this, mm -hmm. this model and and then creating a predictable outcome later that's like the the original author did had none of that in mind and mm -hmm. you know so uh historically the supreme court and courts have really focused on transformative use as one of the the prevailing and strongest factors whereas um you know this competitive you know is the market competitive or not uh, this factor mm -hmm. is um kind of they, they've they've risen its importance and i think that cuts against the the developers of, of generative ai models yeah, you got to be really thoughtful about this. If you're taking Tarantino yeah. scripts, and then you write a Tarantino like movie, and, uh, yeah. you know, that's all clever and good, except Tarantino still making movies, I think he's going to do one more. Yeah. So you literally, it's not the intent. Now, if you're inspired by somebody, um, and, you know, Quentin Tarantino was literally inspired by a lot of the exploitation films of the 70s. Uh, Mm -hmm. And he is doing an homage to them in Jackie Brown, in Kill Bill, uh, in Inglorious yep. Bastards. These are literal homages, but it's so transformative that for you to know that this reference is from The Killing and this reference is from this 70s film with Pam mm -hmm. Greer that you would have never even heard of. And it's such a minor inspiration of this one piece of dialogue or that piece of dialogue. There's no... Like, it's not interfering with the person who made that film in the 70s. And in fact, that person who made that film in the 70s, when people do figure out that it had some inspiration to Jackie Brown, would go seek it out and it would make more money. So you're, but the Andy 100%. Warhol one is like, it became a cult thing. It became a cult thing. Yeah. But the Andy Warhol one is like, yeah. should I buy the photograph or should I buy this colorized version that Andy Warhol did and transformed it? You're like, it's an either or. Yeah. It, it, right. it, it's and, so I'll, easy. I also note that the Supreme Court was, was really only focused on the licensing of the image, the licensing mm. of the work, not on when he made the original mm. work, ah. the derivative work from the phot photograph. So what so does that, that mean? So they haven't ruled, they haven't said uh, that it wasn't fair use when Warhol made the, um, the work of art as a derivative work off of this photograph. They just said using it, licensing it mm. versus licensing it is not fair use so he could make the painting he could put it on his wall perhaps even sell the painting one sell time it at auction. sell it at auction one Maybe. time no yeah. problem but licensing it to because if you did make the painting and sell it at auction one time did that really screw up the original photographers i you might be able to make an argument if they were making prints maybe of prints prints of prints uh maybe but anyway, rest in peace, Prince. Yeah. Man, and by the way, just speaking of Prince, yeah, I know absolutely. you're a music lover like me. He does a guitar solo at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame of While My Guitar Gently Weeps. Oh, yeah. And if hey, you incredible. haven't seen Prince do this solo, because, uh, you know, we just, and we'll leave this in the episode. He does, just type in While My Guitar Gently Weeps, and you watch this with Tom Petty, Steve Winwood, and Jeff Lynne. Somebody had said, like, I don't know if it was Rolling Stone or something. Somebody had said Prince was, like, overrated as a guitar player. And he was like, oh, yeah? We'll see you at the Rock and Roll <laughs> Hall of Fame. And he gives a Mark Knopfler, you know, level performance of a, of a, of a guitar solo that breaks the internet. This video is so good. I'm not going to play it here because I don't have fair use. I don't want to take away from the uh, copyright of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. <laughs> but this video has got 123 million views. It should have a billion. All right, listen, if people want to get in touch with you, they got this issue, you got an email, you got a, a way for them to get in touch with you, uh, Adam? Yeah, sure. Uh, it's uh, a Chevelle at WSGR.com. Um, A-S-H-E-V as in Victor, E-L-L -L at WSGR.com. Perfect. Thanks for doing this. I appreciate you sharing all the wisdom and giving really pragmatic advice to the startup community. And if you want more information on this, thisweekinstartups.com slash basics for more information on our basic series. We do it every year. Uh, thanks so much to my friends at Wilson Sonsini for supporting this and doing it with me on the most important topics for founders. And we'll see you next time on This Week in Startups. Bye-bye.